So it's an interesting dilemma. Because just, just imagine this is the kingdom of darkness on this side. All of us are born in the kingdom of darkness. Unfortunately, all of us are born in the kingdom of darkness. Why? Because of Adam. Because of the seed of Adam. We are all of the seed of Adam. And Adam sinned, and that sin was passed on from generation to generation. And we've all been tainted with sin. So we have got no option. We're all born in the kingdom of darkness. There is only one who was not born in the kingdom of darkness, and his name is Jesus Christ. That's why it's important that we as believers believe and know that he was born of a virgin. Because the seed that gave life to Jesus was not of the seed of Adam. It was the seed of God. It was untainted by sin. So Jesus was holy. He was pure. He was born in the kingdom of light. And when the kingdom of darkness saw the light, it could not comprehend the light, the Bible tells us. Couldn't understand what this was. But we who were in the kingdom of darkness, we saw the light and we were attracted to the light. And said, we want what you've got, Jesus. We want what you've got. Because you've got life. Where we live, it's death. Where we live, we are slaves to sin. We cannot break free. We are captive to our own lusts, to our own thoughts. In fact, we are captives behind bars in this kingdom of darkness. How do we get what you've got? Because we see what you've got and we want what you've got. Jesus came as, a, as an ambassador of the kingdom of light. In fact, he said, I am the light. I am the way, we sang it this morning, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father, he said. When they saw that light, they said, we want what you've got. Jesus spent most of his time preaching and teaching about the kingdom. And he says, there's a kingdom which you're living in, which is the kingdom of darkness. But there's a greater kingdom, the kingdom of light. The kingdom of God. And he says, you can have access to that kingdom. And that's why he died on the cross for us. So that the veil was torn in two and so he could restore relationship for us once again to come into right relationship with God. But the fact remains, there are two kingdoms. Now that wily old fox, the devil, he confuses us and blinds us and we think, I don't serve the devil, I don't do like black magic and mass and do all those evil things, but if you have yourself on the throne of your life, you're in the kingdom of darkness. We are deceived. We think, I'm in charge, I'm in control. Really? You're not in control. Jesus puts it this way. He says, if you are in the kingdom of light, if you're in God's kingdom, you don't have to worry about anything because God your Father will look after you. But if you're in the kingdom of darkness, your life will be characterized by worry because you're on the center of your throne saying, what shall I eat? What shall I wear? What shall I do? How am I going to fix this? How am I going to pay for peace? Your life is filled with worry. Then you start chasing money to fix all the problems. And Jesus said, you cannot love both God and money. Because you'll love one and you'll hate the other. You can't be chasing after these things and chasing after these things. Somewhere along the line, you've got to decide, am I going to cross the line and stand, stand in the kingdom of light and grow in the kingdom of light? The problem is, because we were born in darkness, there's that constant pull back into this kingdom. Simple. I know some of you came and said, Jesus, let me sign up for this today. I came and took it about gifts, but I'm going to tell you how gifts fall into this. God has called you from his, the darkness and called you into his glorious light. Come into the light. Stop living in deception. Now, an interesting thing I was reading with the young people, and, and, and this kind of was frightening. Because it's all about this crazy, self centered eye that's a problem. This crazy self-centered eye. You know, even in our generation, things like iPad, iPod, iPad, iPad, everything about me. Hello! I'm here. You know when guys come in? Okay, the party starts now. I'm here. It's all about the me. It's all about the I. I'm the center of everything. James, I mentioned it briefly last week, but I want to bring a particular scripture. Mentions it in chapter 3, verses 13, uh, to chapter 4, verses 8, if you're taking notes. He says, if you are wise and understand God's ways, in other words, the kingdom ways, prove it by living an honorable life. Interesting, he says, prove it. 
doing good works with the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you are bitterly jealous and there is selfish ambition in your heart, don't cover up the truth with boasting and lying. Verse 15, for jealousy and selfishness, what's that? Jealousy says, I want what you've got. Because you don't deserve it, I deserve it, I want it. I'm better than you, I should have it. That's jealousy. You're jealous about other people's things. Or what their, their abilities are whatever. And selfishness, what selfishness? I'm the center of my life. He says, jealousy and selfishness are not God's kind of wisdom. James's words, such things are earthly, unspiritual, and demonic. Oh, sorry, did, did I read that right? And demonic. The eye is demonic because it's attached to the kingdom of darkness. He says, verse 16, for wherever there is jealousy and selfish ambition, there you will find disorder and evil in every Let's jump to verse four, chapter 4, verse 4. You adulterers, don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? But He gives us even more grace to stand against His evil desires. Therefore, resist the devil and He will flee, draw near to God, hold yourself, and He will draw near to you. Okay, so this is what, what, what shocked me when I was speaking with the young people, and they came to me, and I got a fright. He says, you adulterers. Now, why is that word popping in there? That's, that's a strong accusation, James. That's a strong accusation. What are you saying? What is an adulterer? Someone who says they love someone and is committed to them, but by their actions, they actually love another. Now, I love my wife. When I met her, I fell in love with her, and I started to woo her, and I had to get her affections over. And some of you are still in that wooing stage with Jesus. You don't know him, but he's wooing you. He's He's calling you. He's trying to say, hello, I love you. Even before we knew he loved us, he loved us. And he's pouring out his heart and trying to draw us to himself. That's who he is. He's a good, good father. And he's trying to draw you into the kingdom of light. So there's this wooing stage where we fight him. But then finally we come to a stage where we say, you're the one that I want. Somebody was saying, woo, woo, woo. Okay. You're the one that I want. I'm going to commit myself wholeheartedly to you. Now, if I say I love my wife, I love her to bits, but there's another woman on the side, how does she feel? Does she feel loved? Does she feel special? Of course not. Because your loyalty is divided. What if I said to my to Georgia, babe, I love you so much, I'm so lovely to you. In fact, I'm gonna show I'm so committed to you. I'm gonna spend every Saturday afternoon from two o'clock to four o'clock in your mind completely. Rest of the week, I'm mine. I'll go out partying, I'll go out to the nightclub, I'll stay out, sleep over, I'll come and see you. But because I love you, I'm going to be with you every Sunday afternoon from 2 to 4. You're mine. Hallelujah. She's so excited. Yes, I can't wait. You love me so much. You spent two hours a week with me. That's it. But many of us laugh, and we do the same thing. Come Sunday morning, 8 o'clock to 9 30. Hallelujah, I love you, Lord, I love you, Lord. But the rest of the week, we're joining in the kingdom of God. Now, sit up to me like it is. What Jesus is actually saying, what James is saying in that particular scripture, he's saying, Don't you realize you are committing adultery? So it's selfish motives. Who? Oh, well, let me get involved with Jesus because there's something that I like and I want. But actually, I'm, I'm quite more comfortable married to the world. Or I'm in love with Jesus and I want to serve Him, but I like having this little thing with the world every now and again. <laughs> that hit big time. I felt like a hammer fell on my head. That's what he's saying. You adulterer. Don't you realize that friendship with the world makes you enemy with God? So, now how does the gift fit into this? How does the gift fit into this? We're talking about gifts. Let me tell you, in the kingdom of darkness, we are trapped by our own selfishness, our own desires. We cannot do anything except that which our heart desires. Jesus came to set us free. The 
and open the door. And I love the scripture in Ephesians chapter 4, reading from verse 7 to 8. It says this, however, he, speaking about Jesus, has given, or God, has given us, each one of us, a special gift through the generosity of Christ. That is why the scriptures say, when he ascended to the heights, he led a crowd of captives and gave gifts to his people. Does it not say that? Did you find it in the Bible? So what's that scripture saying? It says, when Jesus came to liberate us, he came into the world, into the darkness, and he grabbed us and he came and he broke open the gates and he took us from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And as he led that crowd of captives, which is you and me, as he led us out of darkness into his glorious light, he says, you're free, you're free. Here's a gift, here's a gift, here's a gift. Through his generosity, every single one of us has been given a gift by Jesus as he leads us out of captivity. Did you read that then? Why do you think he gave us gifts? Why do you think he gave us gifts? For us to sit on our, on our behinds and say, Oh, it's so lovely to be saved. You know, it's watch TV, just relax in the kingdom of light. You know why he gave us gifts? Because he said there are people in the kingdom of darkness that need you. And just that you've experienced what I have given you, you go back there and you give You go and use those gifts to start breaking through into the kingdom of God. And you start bringing them into the kingdom of life. You've got the gifts. And so all of us need to say, God, what is the gift that you've given us? And how do I use these gifts effectively in bringing people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God? Or are you quite content staying in the kingdom of light and forgiving those people who are lost? And when we love one another as Christ called us to love, the world will see that Jesus is alive. How will they know that he lives? By the love that we have for one another. And how do we demonstrate love? By using our gifts. Can you see how intricately these are connected? This kingdom issue must be settled in our heart before we start accepting and using our gifts. Because if we have an issue with the kingdom, when we have these gifts, we're not going to be able to know how to use those gifts correctly. We need to be clear which kingdom we're in. Like I said, I can't pull the wool over your eyes. You will know. Jesus says, you will know them by their fruit. So some of you are saying, I'm an orange tree, I'm an orange tree. Each of us 
so that we can put up our feet and get fat. <laughs> so you know, the doesn't say that. So what does it say? God has given each of us a spiritual gift. For what purpose? So that we can help each other. The gift that we have been given is not for our benefit, it's for the benefit of the Lord. It's a benefit for you, it's a benefit for me. He then goes in, 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 in chapter 12 from verse 18 to 21. But our bodies have many parts, and God has put each part just where He wants it. How strange would our body be if it only had one part? Yes, there are many parts, but only one body. The eye can't say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. Imagine that. Somebody walking into church and his ears and takes a sabbatical tree. It's just crazy. They all need each other. We've all got a very good part. He says, in fact, some parts of the body that seem the weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. You know, how many of you have ever had to have a, a ball stone? Or something like that. Tell them the ball that is not very important. Okay. So sometimes the most insignificant to have a big ball to play. He then goes on to say, and the parts we regard as less honorable are those that we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect the parts that shouldn't be seen, while the more honorable parts are given the parts that um, have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members, so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. And if one part is honored, all the parts are glad. Are you all together? Verse 27, Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Here are some of the parts God has appointed for the church. First, there's apostles. Second, the prophets. Third, the teachers. Then are those who do miracles. Those who have the gifts of healing. Those who can help others. Those who have the gift of leadership. Those who speak in unknown languages. Are we all apostles? Are we all prophets? Are we all teachers? Do we all have the power to do miracles? Do we all have the gift of healing? Do we all have the ability to speak in unknown languages? Do we all have the ability to interpret unknown languages? Of course not. Final verse I want to read here concerning this. It says, So you should earnestly desire the most helpful gifts. But now let me show you a way which is best of all. Now next week I'm going to talk about the way that's best of all. <laughs> this week I want to talk about you are a part of the body of Christ. You could say, I don't need the church. I don't need this one. I don't need God has pulled you here together and knitted you together because you are part of the body. We need to know what is our gifting and how do we apply that in the kingdom. So that we can draw others from the kingdom of darkness into this of light. It's not for our benefit, it's for those who are lost. It's for those who are hurt, for those who are dying. And so, how's this going to work? What I'm asking us to do is, as a church, we've come to a place to recognize that all of us have to start using our gifts. Because the body of Christ actually is like a cripple. It's lying in the hospital bed and you've got drips all over it and it's not active as it should be. And we've got a role to play in it. We need to start getting up and start flexing and doing what God has called us to do. So this year, we are training you in your, in your giftings. The third Sunday evening of every month, we will be having gift training. Okay? It doesn't start this Sunday, it starts next Sunday. We've asked you to give up one Sunday evening a month from 6 o'clock to 8 o'clock and learn how to utilize your gifting. Be trained in your gifting. So we've taken all the giftings and broken them up into eight broad categories uh, because those giftings work together. Do you remember we spoke about the three colors of God's love? The green related to the colors of God, and the red related to the colors of Jesus, uh, and the blue related to the colors of the Holy Spirit, and how those gifts all work together for the benefit of the body. And how the church works together with the more liberal type churches, the more uh, um, evangelical type churches, and the more charismatic Pentecostal type churches. All need to work together because we've all got different things in the body of Christ to work together. And so how it will work is, we, you'll find out after the service, there are sign-up sheets. And underneath those sheets, I'll give you a list now, you choose which gifting area you would like to be trained and equipped. Now most of you have done your gift assessment. If you haven't done a gift assessment, the first thing you need to do is find out what gifts has God given you to use in His kingdom. And we can do that gift assessment. We can have tools available for you to do that. In fact, next week we will have the books available for those who don't, haven't done the gift test. I think they're how much? $5 a book. 
Five dollars a book with the gift assessment, um, and we can just go through it with you to help you understand the giftings God has given you. Those of you who've got your giftings, uh, we put them in these broad categories. Category one is social needs and assisting Christians. And that is the gift of giving, hospitality, mercy, voluntary poverty, help, service, and singleness. They will be meeting at the counseling centre. So Jenny has given us the use of the counseling centre that's in, in Pauling Road. And all of those with those as your gifts, you need to go and meet there. The second one is the human mind and leadership, which is the gift of knowledge, organisation, wisdom, leadership, shepherding, apostle and teaching. You will meet here at Revival Centre, if those are your primary giftings. Artistic uh, or creative potential, which is artistic creativity, craftsmanship and music. You will meet here in the sanctuary. We've got the musical instruments. We're going to be enjoying praise and worship and learning how to use our skills creatively in the church. Um, evangelism and missionary is sharing the gospel. We'll meet here. God's supernatural power will be at the counseling center. That's deliverance, healing, miracles, and discernment. If you believe God's called you to operate in the areas of healing, discernment, and miracles, then you need to get the counseling center for that training. Um, communicating God's word is interpretation, prophecy, and tongues. We'll be here. And then uncompromising trust, which is the gift of faith, prayer, and suffering. If you believe I need to learn about how to pray more, uh, in those areas of engagement, then you'll be here as well. We have isolated counseling because Jenny, who runs the counseling center, is going to be offering counseling training uh, separately from, from the training that we're doing. So if counseling is your gift and you want to learn more, you can sign up for counseling training, but that also frees you up to get involved in one of the other gifts as well. How it will work, I have no clue. The first time we've done it. And so I'm really excited about connecting people's giftings and passions and getting them fired up and giving them the tools they need so we can take this thing from the way. Amen? Who's with me? All three of us. Amen. Good work. I'll see you there. I'm excited about what God is going to be doing. Now some of you got some questions. For example, one of the questions I've had was, um, Pastor, which one do I go to? Because I, I, I've got this gifting, but I really want to do this one. And I, I think I like this one. Someone said, I need to buff up on my weaknesses. I know my strengths, so praise my weakness, maybe I should go to the prayer one. Don't go to your weakness, not even operating in your strength. Also, that scripture we read, it says, use the best gifts. So what's your best gift? Don't bring your weakness to the Lord. Bring your strength. Okay, I'm not good at my mercy gift. Well, don't come and say, please train me in mercy. Hey, you've got no mercy. Forget it. Go do deliverance. Go chase those demons back to hell. Hallelujah. Go find out what is it that God has given you and get stuck in. So find out what are your top giftings. Don't look at your name, gifts, don't look at the gifts that are not operating. Say, what are my top three gifts? Because you'll find that most of your gifts work together in groupings. So if God's anointing you for a certain grouping, get involved in that grouping. Okay, someone said, can I sign up for this and this? No, they all meet at the same time. Unless you can time travel, it's not going to happen. <laughs> sign up for where you're good. Now I know you're all excited, you want to eat the whole meal, but your eyes are too big for your stomach. You know what I'm talking about? I have, I have daughters like that. Boom, 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 boom. Get it over the floor. <laughs> now some of you are looking, man, I need prayer, I need deliverance, I want to be in leadership. And your eyes are spiritually too big. Just choose one and let's get back there. Now, the reason I say I don't know how it's going to work out, because I spoke to my dad about this, and um, he's doing, as, as you got away, he's doing the one on deliverance and healing and, and miracles, because that's his gift, it's his strength, which he really loves to be. And many of you have been healed by the gift of miracles in his life. Amen. Can I get a witness? Anybody been healed to the power of God? Amen. Only two people been healed. How many people have been healed through the amazing power of God? Amen. So, he's going to be there and he said, wait one year is too, too, short, too long. He says, because when the anointing comes and our team is equipped to start doing healing, do you think we're going to wait one year to start practicing healing? He says, we're going to be so if you're in healing, guess what? It's going to happen quickly. So some of you, depending on your groupings, your grouping might say, okay, we're with this group. Let's do a weekend. Is who's free on this day or who's free on this evening? Let's get together and maybe buy a little bit more on that. I don't know how it's going to work. Let's go and see what God wants to do in the group. Now, with the groupings, for example, some of you say, I'm not too keen up on prayer. 
and I need to learn how to pray, but I'm going to be doing leadership gifting. Well, those doing prayer, for example, they say, as we've learned prayer, we want the whole church to learn more about prayer. We're going to have a weekend which is going to focus on prayer, and we'll open it up to the whole church. So those who haven't been going to the prayer can come and learn about prayer. So there will be opportunity during the year for you to learn about the other giftings. So please choose one gift and get paid. Does this make sense? Okay. I'm asking you to please to sign up, find your gifting. Um, let's get plugged in. Like I said, find out what your best gift is. Because if you're the ear, don't say, oh, I'm the ear, but I really wish I could learn how to walk. When you're an ear, then stick to being an ear. Learn how to hear a little bit better than you. Leave the walking to the legs. And that is why God gives us different gifts. Because when I am weak, others are strong. When they are strong, I am weak. Or the other way around, vice versa. So we've got, we've got each other to learn on. So I may not be good at something, I can let somebody else do it. That's why we need each other. Because you've got a gift that I don't have. Chuck, you've got something I need, brother. I've got something you need. And together, as we work together, the body of Christ does to come alive. And we begin to be active in the body of Christ. So choose a category. And I'm going to close with this. Um, there are two Christians I mentioned them last week, and I want to remind you of it. Jonah and Esther. Jonah was a Christian. Well, he was a prophet. Obviously, Jesus and the dead come. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jonah was a man whose heart pleased, was, wanted to please God. And he, he was a prophet. But his problem was, and this is some of you can identify this problem, is I'm comfortable. I don't want to go. And some of you are sitting here this year and say, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Give, give, give. Well, you carry on, Pastor. I'll just be not quite comfortable coming Sunday morning and just leave me where I am. Okay, some of you are like that. But you know what the Lord did to Jonah? He brought a lot of big fish to swallow him and spit him out where he needed to be. So let's get there where God's calling us to be before he sends a big fish to spit us out where we need to be. Okay, so some of you, I'm just giving you the challenge and saying, come on guys. You know what God has called you to do. You know what He's told you to do. He's spoken to you very clearly and very concisely, but you're still sitting on your chair. <laughs> it's time this year for you to get out and start doing what God's called you to do. Some of you are a little bit like Esther. You know who Esther was? She says, don't notice me. I just want to fit in. I want to be part of the crowd. Just leave me here. And the Lord says, Esther, I've called you for a purpose. You are going to come out of the crowd. Because if you don't do your job, your people will perish. And so the Lord said to Esther, come out. And basically Esther just said, okay, Lord. Even though this is too difficult for me, I can't do this in my own strength. I'm trusting you to get me through this. And some of you, maybe you're a little bit scared. And you've got comfortable you are. And you're just like, I'd rather just be a, a wallflower. I'll just watch and observe and just keep quiet. God is also calling you to step out a little bit this year. You know, I've been in some of connect groups, and when we say let's pray, some of them say, I don't pray. Pastor doesn't pray, I'll just <laughs> Maybe this is the year that God is saying, use your mouth and actually start praying. Just take a step of faith and say a little prayer and see what God does with it. Maybe you're the prayer warrior that God's been waiting for you to change this dish. But you've been sitting with the last year. So I'm going to encourage each and every one of you. God is taking this church into some supernatural place I no longer know. But I am all over it. And I'm hoping that you're going to come along for the ride and say, God, I don't know what you're doing in the city of the world, but I'm ready. I don't know what you're doing in my family, but I'm ready. Some people this week, this very week, have felt a shaking. They say, eee, this is getting tough. I don't know if I can handle this. You know why it's getting tough? Because the minute you step out in faith, you stick your head up above. And the devil goes, Ah, uh -huh, is that right, Jets? <laughs> so you think you're smart now? And guess what? You're going to get a little extra activity happening on your side. Do you understand what I'm talking about? We need to be aware and ready and say, Okay, devil, I know the minute I stand up, I'm going to get criticized. Do you know, every week, there are people who sit in the congregation and sit and they criticize. And they think they can do it better. They think you can preach better. They think you can say things. That's fine. Criticize as much as you want. Because I know the minute you actually do something, at least I'm preaching and you're not. 
Because the minute you actually do something, you're going to get attacked. Why am I saying this? Because I'm just encouraging you. When you feel the attack square to your neck, you know God has called me to do this, and you feel those bombs, don't say, oh no, it's not working, quickly shut the door. Say, it is working. The devil's taking notice, and he's not going to fight. Amen. He's not going to fight for us. Amen. You're a good, good father. It's who you are. It's who you are.